AAA game companies are too comfortable these days. Almost like they feel untouchable. Dare I say that they're becoming more anti-consumer. Just the fact that they can put out mediocre or even low quality games and still make a profit is pretty jarring to me. FIFA is basically the same game every year, but FIFA Ultimate Team alone still makes EA enough money to run a small country. So I don't think we'll ever see any changes to the formula there. I think it's that confidence, that ability to release a game that they know is unfinished or monetized up the wahoo and know that it'll turn a profit anyway, that makes me want to scrutinize their games even more. Why do they get a free pass to release crap and make more money than any indie dev studio would? Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, Babylon's Fall, Halo Infinite, budgets in the millions and still, filled with bugs, completely mediocre or missing content. It feels like this has been happening more and more. AAA games are filled with issues, while the company still makes decisions to cut corners and save money at the expense of quality. But why does this seem to happen more as the studios get bigger? It's inevitable, success springs growth, which changes small indie dev teams into large dev studios, until finally they end up as game development and publishing companies. And just like any other company, gaming studios will face new problems brought on by this massive growth. Ones that really have nothing to do with the games they make, but rather the people they hire and the company culture that they work within. So when I see games like Halo Infinite, a game that is good but lacks so much content and polish, I'm always left with so many questions. Why do the devs not have time to fix game-breaking bugs? If the devs don't make the decisions, who does? Did the games management team know about these issues before committing to a release date? I'm gonna generalize a bit in this video. Every game company or indie game studio is different. They may not follow these common company structures, but no matter what, every company has something called corporate culture. If you don't know what corporate culture is, it's basically a set of values or beliefs that a company sets that will determine the practices and behaviors of the people it employs. If the company rewards employees who are kind and reprimands those who are not, the hope is that this will create a kind and positive workplace. If a company gives their employees a performance-based bonus at the end of the year, the hope is that the employee culture will be focused on high quality performance. Every company will be different, but no matter what, every company has a culture and it will make a difference on how employees work, which in turn affects the quality of the game when it comes out. The problem with company culture is that it inherently comes with a set of necessary evils that are detrimental to the quality of a video game. Company culture pushes the idea of hustle culture within a corporation, it encourages competition, and most of all, it glorifies the chase for a better salary. And even though these things are essential for a company to create an effective workforce, what part of this has anything to do with making a better game? Money-driven decision-making is the idea that employees make decisions based on increasing revenue gained from a game. This could be a responsibility to shareholders or a CEO. Maybe the employee yearly bonus is directly affected by the monetary success of the company. Everyone at the company is driven by incentive. And that incentive, most of the time anyway, is going to be money. People make games to make money, that will never change. Even if the game is a passion project, the creator will still want to be compensated for their time in order to go home to their family or friends and be able to pay rent. So this means that everyone in the company is motivated to make money, and their decisions on the game's features will directly reflect that. Instead of asking the question what would be more fun, the question might become what will make more money. Should my game be a one-time price with a couple of DLC packs, or should the game be free to play with a cash shop? Well, which one would make the game more money and therefore my boss more money and therefore me more money? Almost as equally detrimental to the outcome of the game are the employees who are less money driven but are afraid to be the ones to lose other people money. Instead of asking how can I make more money, they ask how can I make sure that my bosses make the most money so that I don't get fired? Ask yourself, would you stand up and be the one to say that we should give up X amount of potential revenue to give the player base the game they deserve? <laughs> Would you be the one to argue with the giant that is Sony in 2016 and tell them that if you had more time and more resources, you could make No Man's Sky the absolute gem of the game that it ended up being? Unfortunately for most of us, myself included, the answer would be no. We all think that we would be the hero and stand up in these situations, but when it comes to messing with people's money, their livelihood, maybe their next yacht, it just doesn't happen very often. Especially in large corporations, your voice just won't be heard. Unless you're a shareholder, in which case you probably got to that position because you prioritized money in the first place. If you want to change your boss's mind about a game feature you're passionate about, you'll have to prove that it'll lead to the overall success of the game. And the only way to do that is by using data. 
Data-driven decision-making is the use of acquired data to justify any decision made within a project. This is one of the most important pillars of creating a successful product. If you have a question on how a feature should be developed, don't guess. Go get the data to prove the answer to your question. Data-driven decision-making is probably the most common type of culture you'll come across in any company or project team. It's common sense, really. Why make a decision without proving that it's the correct one with data? This happens all the time with game genres. Battle Royale is a proven success, a bunch of Battle Royale games pop up. The survival, crafting, open-world multiplayer game is a success. We saw a shift of every RPG to include one or more of those buzzwords. Most decisions, down to the color of your main character's hair, can be proven with some sort of data point. Customer surveys and market research are usually how you collect that data. Ask your customers what they've enjoyed about your games in the past, or what they may enjoy in the future. See what other games have done and whether or not their customers are enjoying it. Collect your findings, analyze your data, and come to your conclusion. So you may be curious as to why data-driven decision-making can be bad. If something has been proven to be successful, then wouldn't we as consumers like the outcome of that decision? Well, first it depends on how you define successful. If something is successful because it made a game more money, doesn't necessarily mean that the end consumer is better off for it. They just paid more money. Second, if data drives all decision-making, it allows for less risk. Yes, less risk is better for your bottom line, but taking risks is how we innovate. Making changes to existing formulas is how we evolve products. If Netflix never came in and disrupted the video business, we'd still be buying DVDs and watching cable TV instead of streaming and binge-watching shows. If Breath of the Wild never reimagined the Legend of Zelda formula, we may be still playing linear games that slowly lose our interest and the game franchise could die. Taking risks means more variation in our choice for video games. Basically, if no one took risks and everyone followed the data, we would have the same game but with different looks to them. Look at Call of Duty or FIFA. That is a tried and true formula there and there isn't much that Activision or EA wants to change about them. It's successful, so they'll continue to put out the same game with minor changes every year and rake in that revenue. As you add more employees to the company, and each one is using data to back up their decisions, or at least they say they are, it becomes less and less likely that any one person will stand up and ask to try something that goes against the data. Hey, I know that all of the data says we can make millions of dollars by doing the same thing we did last year, but what if, and <laughs> hear me out, what if instead of another FIFA game that has loot box style card packs for Ultimate Team, we let them buy the cards directly so the consumer doesn't spend on average $100 to $500 on the game? A leadership hierarchy is basically a top-down power chain. It means that you are constantly rewarded for following the direction of your boss, and your boss follows their boss and so on until you reach the boss at the top who makes that initial decision. This is an extremely common corporate structure and why you have the different levels of positions such as CEO and President, Executive Vice President, Vice President, Director, Senior Manager, Manager, and Associate. This is a structure that allows for a clear sense of who makes the decisions and who you need to report to. It varies wildly from company to company, but the idea is the same. In this structure, you lose a lot of information in the communication up the chain of command. Usually, the employees who are the closest to the work are at the bottom of the totem pole. And as you go up the totem pole for decision making, you'll lose some of the detail that the executive level doesn't have time to be bothered with. As an example, this is actually how Sony is structured. It's called a matrix structure, where there are different business organizations that all eventually report up to the top executives. And each of these divisions usually has enough people to fill an indie dev studio four times over. Communication between any of these divisions is tough. It gets hidden within email or has to be done in a single meeting that the leader of each division will have with each other. But even within a division, communication can get muddy. If we look how the structure would be for an in-house development studio, there are more teams that make this division up. So a fully staffed AAA studio could have hundreds of employees working on a single game, sometimes within different parts of the company that rarely talk to each other. The finance, marketing, and engineering teams are usually in different parts of the company. So coordination between them is crucial, but sometimes forgotten. And it's here that we find the problem. More people can mean more hands to do work, better minds to create with. But it also means more voices to be lost in, more chances for human error. Most importantly, more people require better communication between them. And that's hard to do. 
As you go down the corporate ladder, you end up working closer to the game. This will generally give you more of an understanding of what's going on. You know whether a part of the game development is going well or not, if the combat is fun or if it needs some changes to make it feel better. Maybe another senior manager's team is working on side quests, but doesn't have enough time to make enough of them so the boss decided to repeat some. You know these things because you work on the game day in and day out. Someone at the top who runs the business and not the game will have no clue that any of these problems exist. This poses a lot of problems when it comes to decision making for a game because at that point, the boss who makes the final decision is so far removed from the day-to-day -day work of the game that they don't really know what's working or what isn't. He or she may generally know what customers want or what's best for the company, but how could they know the individual feedback of each beta tester? If something is wrong, the project and dev team will be able to sift through responses and find out each thing that players disliked. But for the higher up management, all they receive is information in the form of presentations. As you go up the chain of command, your time to communicate vital information is incredibly short. So instead, employees give short PowerPoint presentations with the bare minimum of information in order to get a decision. Executives might have an inadequate amount of information to make what could be a game-changing decision. They may have never touched the game at all and have only heard of the game's progress through short PowerPoint presentations and they're the ones that are gonna be making big decisions on the game's future. Now usually, day-to-day -day decisions will be left to those who do the day-to-day -day work. That's how it should be anyway. But the big decisions are always made at the top. And the big decisions affect every aspect of the game. Things like what partner is going to run our cash shop? And should we sign off on how predatory and anti-consumer it is? Should we release a video game that may need a bit more time in development before it's considered done? Executives may not have the information or even the same goals for the game as the devs who are working on the game every day and pouring their heart into their craft. The executives are there to run a business, so they'll make decisions based on what's best for the company, not the game. And if a dev all the way down here can't properly communicate to some executive all the way up here, how will any big decisions reflect the passion of the employees working on the game? If not handled correctly, hierarchy and leadership can lead to a lot of communication issues and uninformed decision making, but it also creates another problem, one that is driven by a desire to climb the corporate ladder through promotions in order to earn a higher salary. Corporate culture can dictate how promotions and performance reviews are handled throughout a company. Most companies reward employees who succeed at what they were hired to do. That's kind of obvious. But this can lead to some very difficult conversations being completely overlooked or dismissed because no one wants to look bad in front of their boss. Or worse, reports can be manipulated to tell a story of minor success even when the majority of the project has been failing. No one wants to be the bearer of bad news, so instead, they frame the story of the data to be positive. This is a mind game that we are constantly playing with ourselves and others. The game of reputation. I want to appear as if I know what I'm doing, like I'm good at my job. The consequences of not doing so could mean that I get docked pay, or maybe I'm no longer up for that promotion that I want. Worst case scenario, I could be taken off the project completely or fired. Reputation and appearances in the corporate world are everything. The way your peers see you, the way your boss sees you, the way your boss's boss sees you. If anyone in the company associates your name with something negative, you are basically fighting an uphill battle for the rest of your time at the company. So your goal when working in a corporate environment is to make sure that you have a good reputation with the rest of the company. And you'd be surprised at what people will do to keep their reputation positive. This poses a huge problem when having to report bad news. If something is wrong and you don't have adequate time to explain it to the decision makers, your bosses will just think that you are simply underperforming. They don't have time to get into the details as to why something isn't working. They just know that something isn't working and you are responsible for making it work. This makes you look bad. So instead, you want to frame the report so that in the short time that you have with your bosses, you highlight your accomplishments and minimize the bad news. Making light of a bad situation is a lot more harmful than you think. Completely omitting certain issues is obviously bad, but framing a report to seem positive instead of showing the reality of the situation can hurt just as much. If the marketing team doesn't properly realize that the game has plenty of bugs or is missing content, or that the dev team doesn't feel like they're going to hit that certain dev complete date, the marketing team will continue to push ads that have a release date or showcase gameplay that may not be working as intended. This gets worse in larger companies because the accountability for something gone wrong may be spread among groups of people. So instead of saying that we have three major game-breaking bugs that we have yet to find a solution for, you might tell your bosses, the ones that pay you, we have fixed seven out of 10 issues and are working towards fixing the last three. In both statements, you have three issues left to fix, but the second one is obviously more positive. 
When you hear that the team has fixed 7 out of 10 issues, you think, oh, they're doing great. They'll be completed in no time. But if you hear the first statement that gives the reality of how serious these bugs are, the issue seems a lot more urgent. So if the dev team stays too positive, their boss won't worry, and therefore won't make any changes to account for the game-breaking bugs. And if the game releases with those bugs, eventually it'll come back to the dev team, but at that point, it's just a game of pointing fingers to see who will actually take the blame. Well, it was the dev team. No, it was the design team. No, the testing team. Well, I mentioned this was an issue and no one listened. And then someone, of course, will say, oh, what's done is done, let's just get a fix out. And there you have a patch that comes out a month after the game releases to put the game into a playable state. No one wants to look bad. Good reputation matters because a bad reputation will destroy your career. Now I will remind you that I'm speaking generally. Not everyone falls into this category and will outright deny wrongdoing or frame their reports to show success for their boss. But I will say from experience in my own career that this has happened plenty of times for things less important than a new video game release. If you've ever worked in a corporate or office setting, I'd be curious to hear what you think about this discussion. Like I said, I work in this type of setting every day, and even though I wouldn't be able to give you any hard evidence of this happening, it seems very possible that it could if you think about some of the recent releases we've seen from bigger game studios. If anything, these problems could only make the situation worse if the company were to be dealing with anything else. Could you imagine how hard it would be to work at Blizzard while the leadership sexually harasses you or people around you? Or what about after, while the company was dealing with investigations and leaders stepping down? This is an extreme case, but it shows in the quality of their games. World of Warcraft's quality dipped immensely and has only recently built back up some goodwill, but what about other AAA games that come out from companies that have way fewer issues than Blizzard? What about the latest Pokemon game? You're telling me that no one at Nintendo knew about the poor visual quality or the weird glitches? Halo Infinite releases without content and left the Halo community angry with the state of the game. Could that be a top-down decision by an executive who was promised that the dev team could fix it as a live service game? Or maybe no one in a decision-making position heard the direct feedback given by testers. Or maybe the executives just didn't care and told the team to release even when they weren't ready. Of course, we'll never be able to prove any of this unless someone from these companies comes forward and starts dishing details about their company's shortcomings. I think this is more interesting as a way to try and understand why game development at large studios has its own set of problems. Just because you make a bunch of money and add a bunch of people to your team doesn't mean that you have less problems, you just have different ones. Doesn't mean that we should give these companies a free pass though. We should definitely hold them accountable for their issues. We as the consumers should not feel guilted into buying a shitty game just because the people working on it might be dealing with office politics. That's not our problem to deal with, that's the company's. It's just better that we try to understand these issues so that we as gamers don't go harassing game devs just because we don't like their product. We should understand that there may be more going on than what we see. But most importantly, I hope you enjoyed the video. Leave a like if you liked it and subscribe for more content. I hope you're ready to enjoy 2023 and I can't wait to see what we talk about next.